welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. All right, well, we're going to get into the word of the Lord tonight. Before we do, let's honor the Lord and just invite the Holy Spirit to come and teach us tonight. If you would stand to your feet, I'm going to get down on my knees and let's pray together. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for what you've already done in this place, God. We thank you for the encouragement and the, and the presence of God during our times of praise and worship. And Lord, right now we pray that as we open up your word, that you would open it up to us. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May we receive it with meekness that it may produce something in each and every one of our lives. And God, we choose right now to listen to look, to give our attention and our interest. God, we declare that no weapon formed against us in this place shall prosper. We come against anything that would try and distract or take away from the ministry of the word right now. We do not allow it in this place, but we thank you, God, that the Holy Spirit is ministering to hearts and that we are able to focus on what you would have to speak to us tonight. God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves, but also we would ask it on all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. We don't think of ourselves as any better than them, but we bless them, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, amen. amen. You may be seated. Get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of Psalms. We're going to be in uh, uh, several places tonight. And tonight I I felt impressed that we needed to talk about spiritual warfare. The beginning of a new year, many of us have been uh, uh, seeking the Lord for this year and and fasting and praying. And don't you know that just the moment you decide that you're going to take a step of faith and step out with God, there comes an attack against you. Just like Daniel, here he was seeking the Lord. He had heard a word from God and now he's, he's trying to apply his heart to understanding. So he was fasting and the answer finally comes... And something's revealed to him in the spirit that the answer was delayed. Why? Because spiritually something was taking place. There was a resistance and a war that was going on that he was unaware of. You and I sitting in this place tonight are in the middle of a war. Maybe you didn't realize it when you walked in. Maybe you didn't know it throughout the week. Maybe you never thought about it in these terms. But the fact is, is that we have an adversary out there that hates our guts wants to steal from us, deplete our resources, would love to kill, would love to just stop us, halt us, get us to lie down and die. And eventually, he doesn't want to just stop there. See, killing isn't enough for him. He wants to destroy. What does that mean? He wants to utterly wipe out the memory of you from the planet, your influence, the legacy that you would have left, the heritage on the earth. See, this is not a game. This is not a joke. We are in a war, church. And so we need to realize that there's something spiritual going on. And sometimes we think that things are just coincidence, or maybe we think that God is mad at us. We think that, you know, something, we, we, we stopped the plan of God because we messed up or something like that. But we also have to be wise enough to realize that there is a spiritual battle going on all around us all the time. And it doesn't get any easier when you become a Christian. The battle gets fiercer for your soul. Why? Because as a non-Christian, you were a part of the other camp. You were one of the sons of disobedience. Jesus said that we were of our father, the devil. But now we've been translated out of that kingdom. We left that camp and now we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Now we are sons of the most high God. Sons and daughters. And you and I have now switched sides, and now we're on the winning side, the Bible tells us. That's good news. Now, the world is fascinated with spiritual things. I mean, you you can't even, you know, turn on the television or flip through, you know, look at movies and things like that or see what books are out, what sorts of things are on the internet without seeing spiritual things. People are fascinated by spiritual things, and yet they're jaded and uneducated about the reality of what the Bible says about spiritual things. People are just jaded. Oh, don't give me that stuff. Heaven, hell, come on, get real. The devil might as well think about the boogeyman, right? 
Or for my Spanish-speaking friends, what is it? La, la, I'm sorry. La, chupacabra? Is that it? Bite your head or something like that? Yeah. No, that got you guys laughing. All right, cool. Now I know who I'm talking to. But many Christians have not been taught about their adversary. And we're not talking about the boogeyman. We're not talking about la chupacabra. <laughs> but we got to wake up and realize that we're in the middle of a fight. Otherwise, we're going to get shell-shocked. The devil's going to beat us up from pillar to post and blame it on God and blame it on other Christians. Divide and conquer, that's always been his MO. Why? Because Jesus even said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. He can get you mad at God or mad at your brother, mad at your sister, mad at your husband, mad at your wife. If he can get you divided, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Many people allow things to take place in their life and flow through life with a target on their heads, not even realizing what's going on. Just pray for the devil. See, the Bible tells us that the devil walks around seeking whom he may devour. Isn't that an interesting word, whom he may? What does that mean? That means that if you know who you are in Christ and you, you know how to war and you know how to battle, then he may not come and devour me. He may not come and devour my family. He may not come and devour my finances. He may not come and devour my church. He may not come and devour my influence. He may not come and devour my friends and family that aren't saved yet, but they're going to get saved in Jesus' name. See, but if he can keep us ignorant, we'll be ineffective in our war. Now, not only are people uneducated or jaded or, you know, that sort of a thing, but people simply just don't know. Did you know that in the Bible, I, I was kind of just looking up words today in the Bible, there's over 150 direct references in the Bible just to Satan, the devil, demons, that sort of thing. Just 150 direct where it just names them, the devil, names them, Satan. Names them demons, Hundred, over 150. Now, if God speaks about it that much in the Bible, don't you think that we should pay attention? Find out what this is really all about? Jesus speaks directly to and about Satan, the devil, and demons. James, Peter, and Paul all talked about the devil. That means that this is not just something that one person made up and thought was funny. This is not a, a, a little kid's fairy tale. This is not a scare tactic. This is very real. And church, we need to understand about our adversary. And we also need to understand how to war. You know the Bible calls you a soldier? Isn't that interesting? As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Epaphras, our fellow soldier. What is he saying? He's saying that we're all in a warfare and we're all enlisted. Now we're in the army of God and now we've got to learn how to wage the good warfare. We've got to be trained in the ways of God so that we can battle and so that we can win in our lives. Look at how God describes himself. You're there in the Psalms, but uh, I'll put it up on the overhead. Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Remember, we said we used to be sons and daughters of the devil. Before we got saved, we were in that family. Why? Because we entered into sin. We fell, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and we were sons and daughters of disobedience. We were ensnared by the devil under his sway. But now we got a new family, we got a new father, we got a new DNA on the inside of us, and our daddy, the Lord, is a man of war. That means that we're his kids, and as a father trains his son, and teaches the son and the father's DNA is in the son or the daughter, the Lord's in us. If God, the Lord, is a man of war, the Lord is his name, then you and I are sons and daughters of that same man of war, the Lord God most high. That means we've got to get who we are. We are soldiers. We are in a war. We have been enlisted in the Lord's army. King David shows more of the picture. Psalm 144. Did you turn there? Psalms 144. Verse number one says, blessed, is, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for a picnic, <laughs> and my fingers for knitting scarves and sweaters. Is that what your Bible says? <laughs> blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for painting pictures in a meadow up in the mountains. 
and my fingers for playing backgammon. No, my Bible says this. It says, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. I don't know how many of you watch those, you know, stupid macho movies that I love, okay? So I call them stupid and macho because that's really what they are. But they get down where they're so ridiculous, and I love it because it is so ridiculous. You know, it's just like something on the inside of a man, you know, it just, it has to be over the top. They have to blow things up like six times. The, the first time wasn't enough, but by the sixth time, you're like, yeah, you know? And they get those, those martial arts experts, right? And, 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 and they just kill a man with their hands, right? And, 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 and if they're going to take someone out, all, man, their fingers, they could just, whoosh, you know, and that guy's going to, man, the whole troop just lays down for, whoosh, all, right, right off their fingers, that's the picture that I get when I look at this verse. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers. Don't, don't let me get the fingers out, right? Why? Because I'll give you the fingers. No, not, 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 not like that. You guys are thinking the wrong thing. But he trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. My goodness. God wants to use you. God wants to use me. Oh, in the flesh, weak, little, insignificant, doubtful, a little insecure, don't have any money, no education, not a person of influence. No, God wants to train your hands for war and your fingers for battle. God wants to use you as his special ops. He wants you going in there and taking care of business. He will train you. Why? Because he is a man of war. The Lord is his name, and he knows how to do battle. Why? Because he's always victorious. Should have had a great big amen on that one. Amen. amen. Tonight, I want to I give you a couple of things that I believe God gave to me on how to war. A couple of things tonight on how to war. You know, it, it'd be one thing to tell you you're a soldier, you're in a battle. This is what you should be doing without telling you how to do it. That's like saying, okay, soldier, go out to battle. He never gave him a gun, never gave him a backpack, never gave him any shoes, never gave him any fatigues or battle armor, nothing like that. Go, what are they going to do? They're going to go out there and get slaughtered. Tonight, I want to give you some tools, give you some weapons, give you some armor, give you some things that you can take out of this place with you tonight, trained for war. How to war? Number one is to cast off darkness. Cast off darkness darkness. Using very specific terms tonight because the Bible uses these terms. It talks about casting. Casting, what does that mean? That means that you take something that you've got and you just take that thing and you launch it as far as you can away from your person. The picture is, is to get that thing and to throw it as far as you possibly can and get it to the uttermost extent away from yourself that you can get it. That is the picture I want you to get about darkness. Why? Because we are sons and daughters of the light. We are children of the light. We are now in the kingdom of light. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. So what are we doing wearing darkness? Can light have fellowship with darkness? No. You go into a dark room, the moment you light up a light, man, bang, it changes the whole scene. So you and I, we cannot walk around like we used to walk. We can't talk like we used to talk. We've got to take those things of our former nature, our former self, take those things of darkness that we know, and we grab a hold of those things and we cast them off as far as we can away from ourselves. Now, again, many people today think of the devil as just this scare tactic, man. He's the boogeyman. He's, he's just a thing to scare your kids into being good, you know, or he's an excuse. The devil made me do it. And they really don't see anything wrong with consulting psychics, reading their horoscope, playing with Ouija boards, using tarot cards. What on earth are we doing Walking through the mall the other day, I heard a lady, yeah, my psychic told me, uh, I said, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. Do you know what you're getting involved in? Calling up your psychic friend on the phone. See, talking to demons. Don't even realize it. Don't even know what's going on behind the scenes. See, there's a spiritual war that we're in. 
The world's going to try and get our attention any way we can, even more subtler than that. See, all those things we know. We, we, uh, God, uh, tarot cards? Are you kidding? Oh, no. Oh, what are you talking about? No. None of that. How about television shows? Talk shows? Uh, psychology? Music? Thank you. TV? Movies? Magazines? Blogs? Articles on the internet? Articles in the newspaper? See, there's all sorts of waves of demonic doctrines that are just passing over us all the time. We don't even realize what's going on. There is a spiritual battle going on for the souls of men and women. And we are constantly being told that things are okay that aren't okay. We're constantly being told that we need to be tolerant when we should be intolerant. We're constantly being told, sit down, church, lie down, and just stay there and be quiet. We don't bug you, so don't bug us. But listen, we are in a war. This is not about bugging anybody. This is about taking ground and taking lives and taking ground for Jesus Christ. Someone came in your house and put a gun to your family's head, you would have a reaction. You would stand up and do something about it. And yet, we turn on the TV and we allow the devil to pull out his gun and point it at our kids, point it at our wives, Point it at our husbands. Oh, go ahead. Turn on the computer. Sit there by yourself in the middle of the night. What are we doing? It's time to take a militant stand against sin and against darkness in our lives. And if you've got any of that stuff in your house, it's time to clean house. It's time to take it and throw it in the trash. A brother of mine showed me... He was all excited. We were having this church service here where we were going to bring our stuff and put it in trash cans up here, man. Brother of mine said, I, I couldn't even wait. I didn't even want to bring it to this church. And he showed me a picture of his trash can all filled with books and, and, and self-help stuff and, and, and this new age psychology thinking stuff. And, man, he was so excited. Why? Because he felt good. He knew he had taken that darkness and just cast it off as far as he could. And now there was a freedom. Now there's a freedom. Cast off darkness. Turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 4. I'll show this to you in the word. 1 Timothy, chapter number 4. First Timothy, chapter number 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit, remember we're talking about spiritual things, we're talking about spiritual warfare. So the Spirit, capital I, speaking about the Spirit of God. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to you and I. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Did you know there are people who call themselves Christians that no longer believe in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? No longer believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as substitutionary for their sins. No, live however you want. Jesus died for you, paid the price. You don't have to do anything about it. You, you're, you, everybody's going to heaven. That is a doctrine of demons. And it's sending people to hell. Amen. Listen, when we hear this stuff, we've got to go back to our word and check it out. Why? Because the Spirit expressly says in the latter times that some will depart from the faith. Not just from faith, but from the faith. Speaking about Christianity. Speaking about the true way of Jesus Christ. Some will depart giving heed, listening to, allowing in, deceiving spirits. And doctrines, teachings of demons. Don't think for a second that some man conjured up in his mind these things that are dragging people away. No, there is a war going on. And there is a spiritual reality that's behind the men and women who are being used as pawns to draw people away. Now, doctrine, teaching, when it goes on the inside of a person, it starts to express itself in life. Are you following me? So just like you and I, when we come into the house of God and we get sound doctrine, 
And we learn that we are supposed to clean up our act. We learn that we're supposed to pray. We learn that we're supposed to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. We learn about love. We learn about all these things, and it starts to express itself in our actions, right, in our life. That's how really it should be, that if we come into church and we hear the truth, then that truth starts to be expressed in our lives. In the negative sense, when we have a false belief about something that is not true, but we operate in deception and allow ourselves to follow after those things, those things start to express themselves in our lives as well. Are are you getting that? That means that what comes up in here, your thinking, what you believe as it gets down into your heart and you start to incorporate that, it turns into an action in your life. There's a root and there's a fruit. Romans chapter 13. Take a look at it with me. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verse number 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. What is he saying? He's saying take those actions, those deeds that come from false thinking, get a hold of those things, identify them, whatever they are, and then take them and get them as far away from you as you possibly can. And then the second thing is put on the armor of light. So tonight, how we war. If we're going to wage a good warfare... We're going to fight the good fight of faith. And what do we got to do? Number one is that we've got to cast off darkness. Number two is put on your armor. We just heard put on the armor of light, right? But we got to put on our armor. And I, I don't think there's anywhere else in the Bible, even though it talks about the armor in several places in the Bible, the most exhaustive place and the best place for you and I to look at. If we're going to find out how to wage our war is Ephesians chapter number six. Ephesians chapter number six. Mark the spot in your Bible Remember it, write it down, do what you need to do. Maybe in the back of your Bible, just write spiritual armor, Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18. Whatever you got to do to get back to this spot. Because when you're out there and when you kind of wake up and you realize, wow, I'm in the middle of a fight right now, I'm in the middle of a battle, something's going on spiritually, and I know it's not that I haven't put off the darkness, I already got a hold of that, I already cast that away, I, I can't identify any sin in my life, you know, there's nothing, nothing wrong on this end, right? Well, that means there's a spiritual war coming against you, something spiritual is battling you. You're going to need to get back to this spot. Why? Because you've got to put on your armor. In fact, I heard one time a lady said she was praying this armor on herself every day. I started doing it. You know, my spiritual life started to change from that point on. Every day, just putting on the spiritual armor. We started to teach it to our kids when we pray with them at night. We put on their armor. After a while, my kids started praying it. We didn't even have to pray it for them. They started praying it themselves. Lord God, we just put on, and they just start going through the spiritual armor. What are we doing? We're teaching our kids how to fight at a young age. Teaching them how to be aware at a young age. This is a reality. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. We're going to read through verse 18, and we'll kind of discuss it as we go along. But put on your armor. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Not just half, not three quarters, not the pieces you like. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. See right there, it's talking about the devil. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. In other words, this is not a natural thing. You're not having all the problems you're having just because it's hard, even though sometimes stuff does happen, even though sometimes it is tough on the earth, even though sometimes it is a struggle. Sometimes we may find ourselves in a place where where we're being chastened by the Lord or maybe God is allowing something in our life so that we can be strong. But listen, there's also a war. There's also a spiritual battle, and it's not always the natural things, we got to wake up and realize, gosh, this is spiritual. I'm in a spiritual fight. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, 
against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Yeah. See, sometimes we think, Mike, man, it's just a little old me. I'm just a little old Christian here on the earth. What would the devil want to do with me? Why would Satan want to come against little old me? I'm not, I'm, I'm the least of it all. But remember that Jesus Christ was talking to Peter and he said, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. You say, oh, Satan asked for Peter, huh? No, look up the word in the Greek. When he says Satan asked to sift you, he was pointing at you like all the disciples. It's a plural word. That means that Satan is asking for everybody. Satan's going after, he, he doesn't discriminate, he hates all of us. And he wants to sift us all like wheat. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. We're involved in a heavenly battle here on the earth. It is a spiritual battle. So how do we do it? Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. How are you going to gird your waist with truth if you don't know what's true? Well, what's true for you isn't true for me, right? And what's, what's true for those people over there isn't, isn't, isn't true particularly, you know, experientially. It might be true for them, but it may not be true for me. Anybody heard that? That's a doctrine of demons. Because if God said it, that means it's settled. It's truth, and it works for you or me or that group over there, even though they may not like it and, and they don't work it, and therefore it doesn't work for them. It's still truth whether or not you like it or not. But we bought into this doctrine of demons, which says, oh, you know, it works in your life, but it doesn't work over here. I tried God, and it didn't work out. But if you're, if you're getting some victory over there, man, you go, boy. <laughs> Doctrines of demons. We're being deceived. It sounds great, and it tickles our ears, but it's a lie from the pit of hell. Don't be deceived, church, because truth is truth whether we like it or not. Just like a bridge that says you can put this much weight on it before it cracks. Oh, that's true for them, but it's not true for me. Well, go ahead and drive your big rig over it and see what happens. What's going to happen? Why? Because that's truth. Having girded your waist with truth, so that means you've got to get into the Word and find out what God says and put that all around your life. You've got to wrap it around you. See, the belt held them together. It was almost like a weight belt with a weight lifter so that they could stand up under that pressure and stuff wouldn't come out. No hernias, no nothing, right? Having gird your waist with truth, they would tuck their, their weapons into that belt. It held them all. They, they, they had those long, you know, kind of skirt things that they used to wear and they would grab those things up and they would tuck it into their belt so that they could run during a time of war. See, you've got to be wrapped around with truth, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. What is righteousness? Well, that's the right position and the right practice of the things of God. And notice that it's a breastplate covers the heart. This comes from the heart. This comes from the inside of you. When you are wrapped around with truth and now you're positionally right with God, you can start to act like it from your heart. The breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means that you're ready to go and tell someone about Jesus. You're ready to go and preach the gospel, the good news of God. How beautiful are the feet of those on the mountains who bring good news and glad tidings. The gospel of peace. Above all, so this is really important, taking the shield of faith. Notice you've got to take it. You got to get a hold of it. This is your choice. Taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You know the word devil in the Bible, diabolos, really talks about a little teeny tiny thing that's just thrown against the same surface over and over and over and over and over and over again. It means to throw against, it's pounding and it's buffeting. And it's coming against that same thing over and over and over. And it's pounding, pounding until finally it penetrates through. That's why it says, 
taking the shield of faith, believing in God's word. You raise that thing up. You lift that thing up. Why? Because the devil's throwing little darts at you, little fiery darts over and over and over. You ever wonder why after you get saved, you start to get some victory in some areas, and then, wait a second, I thought I overcame this. I, I thought I was done with this. And then you get a little bit of victory, and then all of a sudden, here comes that same thing back in your face again. Why? Because the devil's coming back in the same spot, same spot, same spot. Why? Because he's trying to pierce through. He's trying to penetrate. He's got his little teeny darts, and he's throwing them in the same spot, the same spot, the same spot. All you have to do is believe God and his word. Raise up, take that shield, and lift it up, and put it over that spot, and it will extinguish those fiery darts of the wicked one. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. See, that covers you. That helmet covers your head. The helmet of salvation. Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He is the one that covers us. Take that helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. you got to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. That offensive weapon that's in your hand is the word of God. When you speak the word of God out of your mouth, it's like a sword comes out of you, right? It just comes out, slice and dice. You go on the offense when you start to speak the word of God. You now have the victory when you speak the word of God. Jesus gives us an example of this when he's tempted by the devil in the wilderness places. Every time the devil comes against him, every time he's tried, what does he say? He says, it is written. What does he do? He's taking out the sword of the spirit and he is slicing that devil, cutting him. Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now look at verse 18. Praying with all prayer and supplication. Where? In the Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. What is he saying? He's saying that your prayer time is wartime. Maybe you didn't realize that the battle stance for a Christian is like this. Maybe you didn't realize that the battle stance for a Christian is like this. And yet what happens when a problem comes into our life? We go like this. We go like this. We go like this. And yet God is asking us to take a stand. God is asking us to get a hold of our weapons. God is asking us to rise up and be the warriors, be those battle, those soldiers. God is asking us to take a stand against the devil. Don't allow him to come into your house. Don't allow him to come into your life. Don't allow him to mess with your kids. Don't allow him to mess with your marriage. Don't allow him to mess with your finances. Stop him. Why? Because he's going to kill you. He's going to try and wipe you out. But you already have the victory. Jesus said, it is finished. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And now you and I stand in the victory of Calvary. The weapons of our warfare, the Bible says, are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down those vain imaginations, every lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. My goodness. How we're going to wage a good war. Number one is to cast off darkness. Number two is to put on your armor. Number three, I like this one. This is a fun one. Go, fight, win. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. I got to explain this one to you. We used to shout this at football games. Everybody shout this at a football game? Right? Dun, 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 Go, fight, win, right? Maybe that was just me because I was in the band. I'm, I'm sorry about all you jocks and football guys and everything. I was the dude up in the stands like, go fight, win, right? You needed me. Fourth and goal. Ten seconds left on the clock. 
We've got to throw a Hail Mary. And I need you in the end zone, right? What's our charge? Go, fight, win. See, we, we don't realize the hour and the day that we're living in church. Jesus could come back any time. And there are people that if he comes back are going to ask the mountains to come down on them because they're not ready. It's a scary thing. Scary thing. There are people who are getting beat up by the devil every day. There is a lot of darkness in the Inland Empire. And church, it's time for us to take our armor, cast off those deeds of darkness. We shouldn't be looking like the rest of the world looks. We shouldn't be standing in lines for movies about vampires and demons and devils and all that other junk. For hours. What are we spending our money on? My goodness. It's going to be like the end of Schindler's List where we realize, man, I could have saved some more souls. I could have brought some more people into the kingdom. Oh my God, what have I done? That's how severe this thing is. And so it's time for us to cast off the darkness and it's time for us to put on our armor and go fight and win. You can do this, church. Why? Because Jesus paid the price for you to do this. Why? Because he gave you his spirit to empower you to do this. But the choice is up to you and up to me. We've got to go and fight in order to win. No battles, no badges, no bruises and blood, no glory. See, we've got to get in the fight, church. We've been laying down sleeping long enough. The night is far spent. The day is approaching. The Son of God is coming. And there are people out there that are deceived and walking about in darkness, being led astray by doctrines of demons. And we're letting it happen. It needs to end. This church should be filled every time the doors are open. Why? Because we're out there grabbing them and compelling them to come in. We're going and fighting for souls. We're battling for their lives. We're saying, you know what? You're worth it. I love you. And we're on the sidelines saying, not only can I go and fight and win, but you can go and fight and win. You can do this. You don't have to be beat up. You don't have to be broke down, busted, and disgusted. You don't have to wonder where's God and what's God doing. You can know about him. You can love him. You can have a relationship with him and get into a place of blessing instead of cursing. It's what this is really all about. James chapter 4, verse number 7. Great verse in the book of James. Right after the book of Hebrews, you probably know where Hebrews is from Sunday mornings. James chapter 4. Verse number seven, take a look at it with me. James chapter four, verse seven says, therefore, submit to God. Everybody say, submit to God. Submit See, God is telling us, cast off those deeds of darkness and put on your armor. And when you submit, you come under that authority of God and you do what God has called you to do. Therefore, submit to God. None of this works without submission to God. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil. Everybody say, resist the devil. Resist the devil. Come on, you got to say it louder. Resist the, devil. resist the devil. Come on, shout the preacher down. Resist the devil. Resist the devil. There you go. Why am I making you do that? Because if you... Oh, resist the devil. What are you going to do? Are you going to show up... That's not going to work. Once again, guy shows up to your house with a gun. Oh, I resist you. <laughs> not going to make it. Not going to make it. You say, get out of here. I resist you. You have no place here. See, that's what this is all about. When the devil comes knocking, you send him packing. You got to get militants. You're a soldier. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he shall what? Oh, I'm sorry. He shall what? He shall what? That means he is running in terror away from you. Wow. Wow. But we've got to resist. That word resist is the same word that we saw, withstand. In Ephesians chapter 6, 
It's the same word that we get our word for antihistamine. A lot of you guys are using that these days from all the wind and all that stuff, junk that's getting caught up in the air. Antihistamine, it's a, it's a, a histamine blocker, right? It, it stops those, those things. That are, but but antihistami, right? Stemi to stand, anti-against. But not just against, because see, I could stand against this podium like this. That's no big deal. No. When you read it in the Bible, it means to stand in violent opposition to. This is not just a blocker for some allergies that we're talking about. No, let's get a picture of this. Here's the nation of Israel encamped on one side. On the other side, here's the Philistine camp. They are standing against one another at this point. But all of a sudden, a champion stands up taller than the rest. Massive man named Goliath. And he comes out of his tent and he violently opposes the camp of Israel. And he starts shouting curses at them. And he says, you let any of your men come and fight with me. And whoever wins, the other nation will serve them. He says, I defy the armies of Israel. And what happens? Israel just stands against Sits there and cowers in their tent. Oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? Now, they had a king. They had a king that was taller than the rest of them, handsome. He had already won some battles. And yet, we find him sitting in his tent, hanging out. And it isn't until a little guy named David comes out, ruddy and good looking, right? Fair skinned, little shepherd boy. With some food for his brothers. His brothers try and kick him out. What are you doing? Come to see the battle? Listen, there wasn't no battle going on. And suddenly, here comes Goliath out of his tent. And he starts to curse at Israel once again. Starts to say his thing. Starts to come against them. To stand against them. And on the inside of David, he is aroused. And he is riled up. And he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? who defies the army of the living God. And now he comes out and he violently opposes Goliath. Now we get the picture of him with that little sling, right? And he's sitting there like this and whoosh, he throws one and God takes it and just sinks right in the middle of his forehead and Goliath falls over. But the story doesn't end there. Remember, David went and took his sword, cut his head off and ran after the army of the Philistines. That is the picture that we are to get, to stand against. No, we are violently in opposition to that thing. We're going to take that thing out. We're going to take it down. Not going to allow that. We've allowed things long enough. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. I'll put it up on the overheads for you. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. My goodness. The God of peace. Oh, he's a loving and kind God. He is a God of peace. But the Lord is a man of war. And he will soon crush Satan under your feet and under my feet. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. And therefore, that devil has no place. And when you take a stand... You stand on his head. Victorious. Come on, if you got this tonight, give the Lord a great big shout. Oh, come on, give a shout of victory. Hallelujah. Woo. Everybody say these words. Say, I submit to God. I resist the devil. And he shall flee. I submit to God. I resist the devil, resist the devil. And, he and he shall flee. Next time devil comes knocking, you say that Amen. as loud as you just did. I don't care if the neighbors think you're crazy, if your kids think you're crazy. You take your stand and he shall flee. Come on, let's give the Lord one more great big praise tonight.
I want to talk to some of you guys before you leave. You know, we've had a great time tonight in church. Had a great time singing the praises of God and worshiping Him. Had a great time in the Word of God and we learned some things. Understood some things. Had our eyes opened in some areas. And I want to talk to you about your life now. I want you to just take a moment. Cut out all distractions. Come on, give me your attention for a moment. Turn off your cell phone or whatever other things that might be distracting you right now. And just key into what God wants to speak to your life. It'd be a tragedy if we had such a great time in church, came in, sang songs, laughed together, heard the word of God and shouted together, and walked out of this place and you died and went to hell. See, the Bible tells us that hell was made for the devil and his angels. It was never intended for you and I. God's not mean-spirited trying to send people to hell, but we have a choice here on the earth. And we can choose heaven or we can choose hell. Joshua said it like this. He said, choose you this day who you will serve. A lot of times people think, well, that's cool because, you know, I, I, I've chosen to serve God. I've been a good person. I've been really good my whole life and done a lot of good things and, and gave money to charities and, you know, really, really helped out a lot of people and been a nice person. Used to be bad, but cleaned up my act and now I'm good and therefore I'm going to go to heaven. Problem with that statement is nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're good, you get to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible you see a grading scale or a curve that you have to be that good and that gets you into heaven. Because the standard is perfection. And no one's perfect except one. His name is Jesus. In fact, the Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to get to heaven just by being good. You're not going to make it. And I love you enough, respect you enough tonight to tell you the truth and not play games. Some of you would say, well, you know, not only have I been a good person, but I chose the Lord because I, I was raised in church and parents told me we were Christians and, and therefore, you know, they chose God. And so now that's, that's me. I'm a part of that too. They had me baptized a Christian as a child, hung a cross or maybe a St. Christopher around your neck. You went to Sabbath school class, catechism class, Sunday school class. You remember the flannel board stories about Jesus and the disciples and the devil. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We chose God in America. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, denying hell, right? wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents take you to church, call you Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, or go to religious classes, that that makes you a Christian headed for heaven. I don't see anywhere in the Bible it says be born in America and your citizenship in America guarantees you citizenship in heaven. And again, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion, that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, saved, headed for heaven, and denying hell. Come on. Come on, let's talk. Some of you said, well, pastor, I, I understand all that, but not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am, chose to come to church tonight. Therefore, I'm a Christian, headed for heaven. But could, could you take a moment and show me where it says in the Bible that you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian that makes you a Christian? Could, could you show me that? You can't because it's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say sit in church, call yourself a Christian that makes you a Christian. Anymore, you can go down to Dodger Stadium Wear a Dodger uniform, bring your bat and your ball, sit in the dugout and think that you're going to get to play in the game. They're going to find you sitting there, drag you out and lock you up. Why? Because you're not a Dodger. Even though you sit there, even though you look the part, even though you may even call yourself a Dodger, it doesn't work like that. You can't sit in church, call yourself a Christian, and that makes you a Christian. You say, I got that, Pastor, but I got involved in my last church. I sang in the choir, I helped out, I carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions, taught in the Bible classes. I even got a membership card to that church. That's wonderful, and I'm glad you did those things, but could you show that to me in the Bible? It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible say church involvement gets you into heaven. Sing in the choir, help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, teach in the Bible classes. Now you're a Christian, headed for heaven. I don't see anywhere in the Bible God is looking for a membership card to a church when you enter the gates of heaven. That's how you think you're getting there. I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth tonight. You're not going to make it. Come on. Somebody said, but, but wait a second, I know God. I mean, somebody told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas every year of my life and sing the songs. I could quote scriptures to you. Old and New Testament, tell you stories out of the Bible. It's great. 
Glad you could do those things, but have you read your Bible? You know, we're talking about the devil and talking about demons tonight. Demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can check that out in your Bible. Demons believe. The devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, knows who he is. When he was tempting Jesus, he even started quoting scripture himself. Does that make the devil a Christian headed for heaven? No. No. So you know what that shows me? Look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about some mental ascent towards God having head knowledge about who Jesus is. But rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God is looking for your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. Once again, doctrines of demons. This is about what the Bible says, not what society says. What does the Bible say about being born again? Well, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. If you haven't given it to him, then you're not saved. You're not going to go to heaven. And I love you enough to tell you the truth tonight, but I love you enough also to not leave you there. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this, give you an opportunity. One, two, three, pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. Just like one, two, three, bang, your hand goes up just like that. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh. You might be. Get over it. Why? Because think about the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Come on, tonight, you can get right with God in this safe and friendly place, giving Him all of your heart, all of your life, making that statement by raising your hand. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father, but if you deny me, I'll deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Will you confess him before men? I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. Or will you sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God? Your call. Your choice. I've done my job tonight. Told you the truth. God loves you so much. He sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. He died so that you and I could be forgiven of all of our sins, but he was raised again to life so that you and I could live with him. Tonight, it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Now, who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand in this place? If you're lukewarm in this place, what does that mean? A little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token of prayer every now and then, a little church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because Jesus said in the book of Revelation, I'm coming again. Don't you know he's coming soon? And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, if that's the condition of your heart that I just described, you can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it and put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better. Better than being in hell. All right? I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching in the foyer by television, you can get your hand up and then come on into the church service right afterwards. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Three, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's three. There's four. There's five. All up in that family. There's six. Don't clap. There's seven. There's eight. Anybody else? Nine, 10, 11. Thank you. God bless you. 11, why? 12, 13. Thank you guys back there. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? We got 13 wise people. You guys can put your hands down in the family room. If I didn't already see you, just raise it up high and wave it up. Thank you. There's 14. There's 15. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Need to give God all your heart. Need to give God all your life. Come on. Come on, if you're sitting there wondering, should I do this? Yeah, you should. If you're thinking, is he talking to me? Talking to you? Come on, come on. I didn't embarrass them, I won't embarrass you. 15 wise people already. Anybody else? 
Real quick, anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, real quick, all 15 of you, if you raised your hand, or if you're out there, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to give a clap and a shout. We're going to sing a song as we do. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. But we can't do that till we get you down here. So if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you just come right now. From the family members, bring your kids. Come on, they'll remember this. You guys from the foyer, you can come too right now. Let's all stand and welcome them. And if you raised your hand or you should have, you just come right now. Come on. Lord, I give you my heart. Hallelujah, they're coming. Let's give them a hand. Give you my soul. Come on, you can come too. I live for you alone Every breath that I take This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. You just make your way to the front right now. Lord, have your way in me. Anybody else, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front right now. Get your stuff. Get in the aisle. Come on down. They're still coming. You can come too. You can come too. Come on. Hallelujah. They're still coming. Come on, let's give them a hand. Let's give them a hand. Everybody else, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Hey, everybody up front. Oh, my goodness. This is awesome. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. All right. I want to introduce you all to a friend of mine right over here to my right. This, this is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You already got past me and talking about the devil and all that kind of stuff, okay? Pastor Dave's a really good guy. He's going to do three things. Let me tell you what they are. First thing he's going to do is he's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, all right? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff. Everybody loves free stuff. We love giving away free stuff. So that's a neat relationship that starts out, right? We'll give you a couple free little booklets that our pastors wrote that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God, okay? Third thing he's gonna do is he's gonna introduce you to someone in our church that we call an SPT. Stands for Spiritual Personal Trainer. Basically, it's a friend in church, someone who will come alongside you and help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Heard of a physical trainer who helps you get buff like me, right? You say, don't, don't tell me about that band nerd, right? Listen, spiritual personal trainer is a friend will help you to get buff spiritually in the ways of God so that you don't go back into the world and get knocked around by the devil, but that you're strong and healthy in the things of God. You need a friend in church, and an SPT is that friend who will help you. So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Dave. Let's give him a hand as they go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Woo!